On the 18th of May, 1291, Acre, the last bastion of the Western Crusaders in the Holy Land, fell to the Saracens and the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, born of the First Crusade nearly two centuries before, finally and irrevocably collapsed. Thus ended the great European dream of a Christian Middle East. The resonant and sacred sites of scripture were to remain in Islamic hands, effectively off-limits to Christians until Napoleon's time some five centuries later. With the loss of the Holy Land, the Knights Templar lost not only their primary sphere of military operations, but also their primary raison d'etre. In military terms, at least, they could no longer justify their existence. Their kindred military religious orders had bases elsewhere and other crusades to fight. The Knights Hospitaller of St. John were to establish themselves first on Rhodes, then on Malta, and to spend the next three centuries resting control of the Mediterranean for an ever more mercantile Christendom. The Teutonic Knights had already found their new vocation on the Baltic, exterminating the pagan tribes there and creating a Christian principality which extended from Prussia through Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia to the Gulf of Finland. The Spanish orders of Santiago, Calatrava and Alcantara had yet to expel the Moors from the Iberian Peninsula, while the Portuguese Knights of Christ were to devote themselves increasingly to maritime exploration. Only the Templars were left without a purpose and without a home. Their own ambition to establish a principality for themselves in the Languedoc was thwarted and remained stillborn. The decade and a half that followed the fall of Acre was to be a period of decline for the temple. Then at dawn on Friday, 13th of October 1307, Philippe IV of France ordered the arrest of all Templars in his domains. During the next seven years, the Inquisition moved on to the center of the stage to finish what the French king had started. Templars throughout Europe were imprisoned, tried, interrogated, tortured, and executed. In 1312, the Order of the Temple was officially dissolved by the Pope. In 1314, the last Grand Master of the Order, Jacques de Molay, was burned at the stake, and the Temple effectively ceased to exist. Robert Bruce's career spans this crucial period precisely. He first appeared in a position of prominence in 1292, a year after the fall of Acre, when he became Earl of Carrick. His life attained its climax with the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314, some three months after Jacques de Molay's death. In 1306, a year before the persecution of the temple began, Bruce himself had been excommunicated and was to remain at odds with the papacy for another 12 years. Because he had ceased to be recognized by the Pope, it was impossible for Rome to treat with him or impose her will in his domains. In effect, the papal writ no longer ran in Scotland. And thus, in those parts of Scotland, the decree which abolished the temple elsewhere in Europe was not, in accordance with the strict letter of the law, applicable. If knights of the order, fleeing persecution on the continent, hoped to find a refuge anywhere, it would have been under Bruce's protection. A spate of archaic legends and traditions has for centuries linked Bruce with the Templars, even if the association between them has not been satisfactorily defined. The graves in Argyll provided persuasive evidence for these legends and traditions. They dated from the relevant period and were located in a region where it would have been natural for refugee Templars to seek safety. The closer one looks at Bruce, moreover, the clearer it becomes that he and the Templars had much in common. Bruce is usually perceived as the central figure in medieval Scotland's struggle for independence. But Bruce was intent on something more than just thwarting English domination. What he sought was nothing less than the restoration of a uniquely Celtic kingdom with specifically Celtic institutions. These may even have included ritual human sacrifice. In medieval Ireland and Wales, even where England's Norman sovereigns had not established their sway, there was no centralized authority. Both countries were torn by internecine squabbles between a multitude of local princelings or chieftains and their clans. Scotland was the only Celtic realm with well-formed and independent political institutions at the beginning of the High Middle Ages. In Roman times, of course, Scotland had been dominated by the Picts, who continued to play a prominent role in Scottish history until the mid-9th century. But in the late 5th century, Celtic settlers from Ireland, particularly from Ulster, 
had begun to settle in the west of the country and to establish what is now called the Kingdom of the Dalriada, one of whose ancient strongholds was Dunod, just three miles from Kilmartin. For 350 years, the Dalriada in the west and the Picts elsewhere struggled for supremacy, each at intervals gaining a temporary ascendancy, then losing it again. Though often violent, the struggle was not always so. It was also cultural and dynastic, and there were periodic high-level intermarriages between the two peoples. By 843, however, the Dalriada had effectively triumphed. The Picts were not so much defeated militarily as subsumed. Pictish language and culture entirely, albeit gradually, disappeared, and Scotland, under the aegis of the Dalriada king, Kenneth MacAlpin, became a unified Celtic kingdom. Around 850, Kenneth was installed at Scone as monarch of all Scotland. There were still to be internal vicissitudes, intrigues and strife of the kind immortalized by Shakespeare in Macbeth, but under Kenneth MacAlpin's descendant, David I, the feudal kingdom of Scotland finally emerged in 1124. Although the Normans had first ventured into Scotland under William Rufus, son of William the Conqueror, there was no large-scale or successful Norman penetration until David's time. David himself was thoroughly Celtic, the son of the Celtic king, Malcolm III. During his reign, however, large numbers of Norman knights were allowed into the country. So, too, was monasticism, chiefly under the auspices of the Cistercians. Nevertheless, Scotland remained a wholly Celtic kingdom, and there is evidence that much Celtic thought persisted there long after it had vanished from Ireland. Among the unique institutions created by David was the office, subsequently hereditary, of the royal steward of the realm, later called the steward, the office from which the Stuart dynasty was to derive. The steward was a kind of hereditary manager of the royal household or hereditary court chancellor, very similar to the so-called mayor of the palace in Merovingian France three centuries before. Just as the mayors of the palace eventually supplanted the Merovingians and formed the Carolingian dynasty, so in Scotland, the stewards were to supplant the dynasty of David. The first steward, Walter Fitz Allen, was of Celtic Breton descent, the son of one Alan Fitzflauld. Alan may also have been descended from a Scottish thane, Banquo of Lochaber, whose legend finds its way into Shakespeare's play. Among King David's entourage was a Norman knight, Robert de Bruce. David conferred upon him the Vale of Annan, which guarded the approaches to Scotland through Carlisle. He was also a close friend of the English king, Henry I, and held extensive lands in Yorkshire. Robert's family is generally believed to have come from Bruss or Bruce, now Bricks, just south of Cherbourg. More recently, however, it has been suggested that he was in fact of Flemish origin, descended from Robert de Bruges, the wealthy Castellan of that city three quarters of a century before. Robert disappeared from Bruges in 1053, the year in which Matilde of Flanders married William, Duke of Normandy. He may well have accompanied her into France and then, thirteen years later, accompanied her husband on the invasion of England. Although the Robert de Brosse of King David's time was of Norman descent, his great-grandson married David's great-granddaughter, the niece of the Celtic kings Malcolm IV and William I. The Robert Bruce, who was later to figure so prominently in Scottish history, could thus claim blood descent from the ancient Celtic royal house and eventually back to Kenneth MacAlpin of the Dalriada. And when Robert Bruce's daughter married Walter the Steward, or Stuart, the dynasty later known as the Stuarts, was born. The Celtic element remained prevalent in Scottish society until the end of the 13th century. Thus, for example, the most influential noblemen in the realm were the 13 earls, or thanes, who derived their lineage and authority directly from the older kingdom of the Dalriada. Among these earls, the most important was the Earl of Fife, who exercised the hereditary right to place the new king on the throne during the coronation ceremony. The coronation itself was traditionally held at Scone, two miles up the Tay River from Perth, and the throne of the kingdom was built around the famous Stone of Scone, supposedly brought to the site by Kenneth MacAlpin in 850. Scone itself had been a sacred or semi-sacred place since pre-Celtic, Pictish times. Its central point was the Hill of Belief, now called Moot Hill, here, in a ritual dating back beyond recorded history, a new monarch would be seated on a stone and invested with the regalia of his office, 
including probably a rod and a mantle. Thus would the king be wedded to the land, to the people he ruled, and to the earth goddess herself, often portrayed in animal guise. In the Irish version of the rite, a mare would be sacrificed and boiled in water in which the newly installed king bathed while drinking the broth and eating the beast's flesh. In this way, it was believed, the fertility of the land and the people would be ensured. By the 12th century, in the wake of the Crusades, this archaic principle would be amalgamated with schemes of esoteric Judeo-Christian tradition to produce the corpus of poems now known as the Grail Romances. These, as we shall see, were to have a very specific pertinence to Scotland. The coronation of Alexander III in 1249 was typical of the Celtic rites that prevailed in Scotland long after they had vanished elsewhere. When Alexander was seated on the throne at Scone, an aged Highland bard formally recited, in Gaelic, the new monarch's genealogy back through the Dalriada to the first Scotsman. As might be expected of a Celtic ruler, Alexander was always accompanied by a harpist. When he traveled, he would be preceded, as tradition decreed for a Celtic chieftain, by seven women singing his glory and his pedigree. Not surprisingly, in such a milieu, the church exercised only the most tenuous of holds. During the ninth century, Scotland seems briefly to have provided a refuge for surviving splinter groups of the Celtic church in Ireland. Under one of these splinter groups, the Selly, Day, or Coldies, a monastic system was established but never came to wield the influence it did across the Irish Sea. Despite an influx of Cistercians in the 12th century, the Roman Church had all but disappeared. In Lothian, for example, no bishopric was to be founded after C950. Nor was any religious community to be founded in Strathclyde after that date. But the Celtic Kingdom of Scotland, which had attained its apotheosis with Alexander III, was to die with him. In March 1286, returning one stormy night from a council at Edinburgh, the king became separated from his escort and was found the next morning with a broken neck. His demise was not only to precipitate a major internal crisis and a bitter struggle for the throne, it was also to provide England with an excuse for meddling, on a hitherto unprecedented scale, in Scottish affairs, 